welcome to another edition of Tabloid Talk, brought to you by Tabloid TV, a show where we unpack the important stuff. I am your host, Mohammed Ismail. Like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button below and the bell icon to ensure that you get a notification every time a new video is added. This week has been a bit of a slow news week, except that Donald Trump remains a sore loser, not affording the same presidential courtesy to President-elect Joe Biden, thus breaking decades of White House tradition. And then ANC bigwig Ace Mahshule was issued a warrant of arrest which did not seem to have bothered him much. And we also have a little more loosening of the lockdown level one restrictions. This month, South Africa commemorates the 160 years arrival of the indentured laborers to the country. Over more than a century and a half, South, Africans, in South African Indians have come through the annals of history to develop and grow rich communities. The Durban-based 1860 Heritage Centre leads the way of these celebrations in several events across towns in the province, starting with a virtual commemoration on Thursday evening to Monday celebrations, starting at the 1816, 1860 Commemoration Monument site at the beachfront. KZN Premier Sishle Zikalala will lead the proceedings. About 200,000 Indians arrived in the country to work as indentured laborers in the sugarcane plantations of what was then known as the Natal Colony. They arrived over a period of five decades and some later worked as coal miners and in the railway. As more of them arrived, these new residents honed their skills, whether it was as a fisherman, a farmer, a tailor, or an entrepreneur, a new community flourished and took root fast. Today, many of these descendants of those very first people to set foot on South African shores are the captains of industry and commerce. In today's tabloid talk, we chat to Dr. A.V. Mohammed, who is the financial director of the 1860 Heritage Center, about this rich history. Stay tuned. We will be right back. Welcome back to Tabloid TV with me, Mohammed Ismail. This is Tabloid Talk. The 1860 Heritage Center this month celebrates 160 year, the 160 year commemoration of the arrival of indentured workers in South Africa. About 200,000 Indians arrived in the country to work in the sugarcane plantations of the then Natal colony under inhumane conditions. They arrived over a period of five decades and some of them later worked as coal miners and in the railway. As the years rolled on, many changed their lives and later became captains of industry and commerce, including the whole social welfare platform in South Africa. Why do we need a heritage center and why should the arrival of the indentured worker be celebrated? Today we talk to Dr. A.V. Mohammed of the 1860 Heritage Center and the importance of the recognition of these forefathers. Uncle A.V., as I always know you, as I call you, welcome to the show. Jazakallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Thank you to have me on the show. It is a privilege and honor as a direct descendant of the people of India in South Africa. It is very, very widely important that the history of the indentured laborers who arrived in this country in 1860 to be documented for future generations to know that the Indian slaves who struggled here were and are now part of the history of the democracy of the Republic of South Africa. Well, you almost answered my uh, opening question because I was going to ask you why is these, are, are, are these celebrations so significant for us as South African Indians? You know, years gone by, attempts were made to educate the people that the Indian society is a fusion into the African society of South Africa. And it is not negotiable that the Indians are not part of history. We are very much part of history of this country and we have played not a small role but a major role in the democracy that we enjoy today. How is this, you, you brought up a very lovely word, fusion. How has the fusion worked as us coming 
into South Africa as indentured with the traditional African people, the crossover cultures, integrating of cultures. It's, it's, a, lovely, it's a lovely history to talk about. Fusion may be a word which may be highly intoxicated in the minds of humans of what it can be. But if you look at the culture and if you look at the belief of the Indian community, be it the Muslim or the Hindu, and the culture of the then Zulu people that lived in the colony of Natal, we believe in the same principles. Our principles are one of humanity, one of mankind. And when I mean fusion means we could relate to each other, our forefathers could relate to each other, and they could understand the reality of each other, that each person's purpose was understood. That is an important factor. And we could know that being a slave, you were deprived of many, many luxuries. And so were the Zulu nation that was here during that time of 1859, 1860. Uh, they didn't have it all. And we can imagine what this country was 160 years ago. So there's been a crossover in culture, a crossover in tradition. And we've had historical icons coming to South Africa, bringing in rich tradition, rich culture, even the minor bird, for example, uh, Bachapir, uh, people from the Hindu religion, the, 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 the Tamil religion, and bringing all that rich history and amalgamation, bringing it into South, South Africa. I, I think that's, that's, that's very fabulous. And that fusion of old and the fusion of new, is there a split in terms of the people of old and the people of new? You know, I must say this. The people that came here, whether they were the indentured laborers or the traders or people of uh, great personalities that came, our generation of today, the 21st century, will not be able to match up with the rich culture, heritage, ethics, character, kindness, social being, love, caring for each other, and important, trust each other. I don't think today's youth are inclined towards mutual respect of fellow human beings, irrespective of race, color, or creed. Religion may be a part which is being played, which is slowly being eradicated by the youth of today because of the priests, the Molanas, the reverence. In religion, we are a divided society. If you take the Christians, you've got four denominations. You take the Indians, you've got the Tamils, you've got the Hindus, you've got the Muslims. If you take the Muslims, we are further fragmented into different rituals, different beliefs, different customs. And these are major factor in the division that has been caused in society. So today's youth is confused of who he has to follow and where he has to follow. Typical example, whether you go to an Anglican, Catholic, a Protestant church, whether you go to a Sunni boss, you go to a Tablik boss, whether you are Tamil speaking, you Hindu speaking, which temple you go to. So we are one big divided community and we are fragmenting and contaminating the youth to such a degree that religion and mother tongue is completely going to be lost in the next 20 years. Uncle A.B., contributing factors to that, you brought up a very important point about the youth. And I remember many years ago, I spoke to an elder in the community, and he told me very simply, Mohammed, there's nobody behind us to lead and to take over. What is the contributing factors that, that cause this erosion, where I would look at you now and say, it's going to end with Uncle A.V. when he's gone, and then the history is lost. How do we rectify that, bring it closer, bring it back to, to, to our shores? The single biggest factor is there's no trust 
between the youth and the elder. And there's no succession planning. By succession planning, I mean take institutions. And take myself, for an example, I'm in 1860. By now, I should have somebody trained to take over my place in the succession planning program. But the people that belong to organizations are fearing for loss of position, of power that they enjoy in organization. So they are afraid and reluctant and have a don't care attitude and mistrust the youth. So the youth are at a street corner, left like a ship without a captain in a very big ocean. If the community, irrespective of which religion and sect you belong to, do not take the youth into the confidence and don't bring succession planning with trust, then we are going to be a lost society for many, many years to come. Coming to South Africa's indentured workers, uh, perhaps with the promise of a better life, yet these very people were exploited and they've been, they were exploited to the hilt. Yet today, they are now captains of industry and, and commerce. How tough has this journey been and how important it has turned out to be with, and I would say that if indentured laborers weren't brought to South Africa, do you think South Africa would have the same makeup it has today economically and any, any other way, social welfare, the works? I, I will not agree <coughs> with the major contribution of the indentured laborers other than they came here to work in a sugarcane plantation. And all of them that come here were not business people and not traders. So over the period after the 1860, there were traders that arrived after the 1875-1880. I know the Muslim traders arrived in this country in 1874. And in 1880, uh, the Muslim purchased the first piece of land in where the Great Street Juma Masjid stands today. And that property was owned by a Tamil woman. But it was the traders that came here in 1874 that purchased these lands in 1880 and then made. In my opinion, very few of the indentured laborers were able to become successful business people other than those people that started farming, started selling, where Juma Masjid stands today was the first morning market. So the people did small industries, minor industries, creating fruits, vegetables, uh, creating some articles that they could bring and manufacture. But the real industry, the captains of industry started well when we started reaching after the 1880, where the traders came in via Mauritius and they opened first was basically grocery stores, food items to be shipped and moved. But taking that into account, be it may, if it wasn't the, all the uh, indentured laborers that were involved in industry, but there were people that came here as industrialists. They have formed the nucleus of the industry that we have in this country today. And that made us very, very self-sufficient as Indians that we did not rely on handouts. Mm. <clears throat> the people who came in as traders and some of the affluent, uh, what I would call indentured laborers, were then able to build minor institutions like temples, church, mosques. And if you look back at history, the Indian community has progressed in South Africa because of 
they want to leave a rich heritage and were self-sufficient without assistance. I mean, see, there was not government-aided mosque. There wasn't rent for rent to build a mosque or rent to rent to build a church or a temple. So the Indian built these institutions of learning, institutions of prayer, with their own amount of money, and it has stood the test of time. I'm saying 160 years, there are institutions that are over 100 years, and we're going to be proud of them that they had a great foresight, great endeavor. I'm saying, I must give you one example, I don't know whether you're going to be saying. I'm going to say, take in 1895 when all the lands were purchased for the Juma Masjid, which is an iconic landmark. I mean, see, it is an internationally recognized icon landmark. But what is so important? One has to look at it from the prospects of that, that mosque that was built, and then there were commercial entities and residents built around it, plus a school. What was the reason? It was a reason that was primarily done that that institution becomes self-sufficient and the place of worship to God is not a beggar that every month you're looking to pay salaries and you're looking for water money to pay light money or to pay. Mm -hmm. So take that insight. Well, today's, today's time, which is the 21st century, even a youth will not look at it because he will consider himself selfish. But the old people did not consider selfish. Those great forefathers thought of God, Allah, and built institutions and made them self-sufficient that they were not handouts for maintenance, for the upkeep of the place and being. So <laughs> great stride had been made by traders that came in. Okay. They had the money. So in other words, we created or the forefathers, our forefathers, created an economy within an economy. And I'll tell you why, just for the purpose of discussion, if, if you look at the indentured laborers, they worked in the sugarcane fields during the day, and at night they were fishermen. So they created a huge fishing trade, and along came big business, or colonialists, and saw this and disrupted everybody and, and removed them from where they were. And then the economy was created, and the fishermen lost their trade, and the markets were disrupted and everything. And so essentially we created, created an economy within an economy, would that, be, would that be correct? Well, you know, the word that I love, you know, is fusion, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's not only fishing, you know. You grow bananas, yeah. you grow tomatoes, potatoes, onions. I would say the people came here with no money. What they were paid would fit the amount. So how could they live? And the first thing they needed was food for their own nourishment. So where there is the fish, where there is animals to slaughter a sheep or a goat. Goat were very popular at that time. Uh, your own vegetables, your own farming. And it gradually went into a situation where those from a minor industries, self-sufficient first, became bigger industries. We became a, a, a farming community. We became a fishing community. And <laughs> very early part of the year, I know we had people that had butcher shops. So we needed meat as well. Not all were vegetarians, you know. Uh, when the Muslim traders come, uh, or when they came to South Africa, uh, there were rich people that came from poor bundle in the state of Gujarat in India. So there were not any people that were not affluent. So I wouldn't see them uh, eating. Mm. Of course, they had to get the lentils, the beans, and all from India until, you know, we don't have it up till today. After 160 years, we still have to import spices from India. So there's no spice industry here. There's no major lentil industry here. So even clothing, Indian clothing, you know, almost 50% of clothing is still got from India. 
So you said, you know, how we have come. Indian clothing in the 21st century today, major chain stores in South Africa presently are importing 50% of the clothing from India. Absolutely, that's, that's, that's amazing. The, the issue around the Gray Street, I just want to touch a, digress a little bit, the Gray Street Masjid, that, that, that is a, a seat of the development of culture. And it's not only iconic for Muslims, it's iconic for any other religion because the Masjid has been open to all religions, especially when you have your cultural days. You, you've had some fabulous icons coming to the, to the Masjid. And I just want to explore a little bit about some of those visitors to the Masjid. How has it developed the, the Durban culture and the Durban history over the years, from its initial development to where it is now? Well, again, the forefathers played an important part. When a problem happened between two Muslim traders around the 1880, 1881, Mahatma Gandhi was brought to this country to fight the legal battle. <laughs> and one of the properties, the conveyancing is done by them, by Mahatma Gandhi. Where the Dennis Hurley stands today, that property belonged to the people that donated the property to Juma Masjid, the Javeri family. And they donated it to the church. And they sold it to the church for a thousand pounds. And the money that they got, they gave it to the church. But uh, Juma Masjid has played a vital role in the politics of South Africa. The ANC government that was hiding in the earlier days used to have the meetings where Nichols Square Garage stands today and when the security police used to harass them, they used to come to the Great State Mosque at the back where there's a courtyard, and they used to have the meetings there. And the security police wouldn't know from which gate to come because there were eight different entrances to the Great State Mosque, which obviously have the Madrasa Arcade as an adjoining property. If you look at the great Muslim priests that have arrived, and besides Mahatma Gandhi that has come, was Hazrat Sufi Sab in 1895. Why did he come? He was asked to locate the grave of Hazrat Bashapir. And by him coming here to South Africa, he led his prayer there. And it's no small man we're talking about Hazrat, Bash, uh, Hazrat Sufi Sab. I personally, in my experience, and knowing full well that the movement of the religion of Islam spread in this country with the arrival of Hazrat Sufi Sab. So if I have to give credit for the spread of Islam in South Africa, I will place it on Hazrat Sufi Sab, and he came to Great Street Mosque. Hazrat Bashapi passed on on a Friday in Great Street Mosque. All the previous mayors of Durban used to visit the Great Street Boss, especially when it used to be the birthday of the Holy Prophet. Mm. Used to have a brigade march past. They used to take the salute outside the mosque. So it was a major occasion where the governor or the mayor, at that time it was governor and the mayor used to be there. We had Mandela visit the place. Nelson Mandela. I think Muhammad Ali also came there. Muhammad Ali was also there. Yeah. We had Nelson Mandela. And then, almost near 2000, when Iraq was invaded, uh, George Bush said that Nelson Mandela has blessed him to attack Iraq. He came to the Great Street Mosque to confirm and answer the question that he in no way made the statement. We had great visits from the Cardinal Napier, who is one of the hundred cardinals that select the Pope. We have had the Hindu Masava. We have had the Jewish faith. We have had the Zulu King. We have had Praveen Gordon. We have had Zulu Keys, the Premier. We have had Willis in Skunu on one or two occasions. We have had the Consul Generals, the High Commissioners, of India. We have had leading businessmen that have come from various parts of the world. 
So, you know, there's a very good Urdu saying, if you haven't come to Grave State Mosque, you haven't been to Durban. Absolutely, indeed not. Indentured workers, to me, is a euphemism for modern-day slavery. And you use the word slaves. From where I sit, our forefathers were brought to South Africa as slaves. Why do we need to use the word indentured workers? Why can't we just say slaves? Well, again, the so-called authors, writers, media people have a very good word that they are convenient to say when they want to copy a word, slave, mm -hmm. or when they want to use a more highly qualified word to call it indenture. So I think it's this a manipulation of the word indenture. Uh, maybe somebody was threatened previously to say, hey, don't call them slaves, they were not. I see there's, there's no way, it's not negotiable. They were slaves. They were called coolie boys. Yes. So why, why do we have to apologize to the world today that they were indentured laborers. Uh, I don't agree with that. But be it may, it is now an accepted fact in discussing purpose to call it indenture. But believe me, they were slaves. And they were coolie boys. Yes. Not two ways about it. There's a campaign going around. I've seen it somewhere. I saw it on Facebook and say, I, I don't know who's driving the campaign, whether it's coming from your center or not. It says, and the logo says, I am proud to be coolie. Uh, you know, negating everything else where people are talking about indentured workers, indentured laborers. Call us coolies, we're proud because we came to this country. Do you know anything about that, that I'm proud to be coolie campaign? Technically speaking, I haven't heard it in a full context and I would not like to be judgmental on that. But, you know, you're an Indian. Why aren't you, why are you called an Indian? Because of my forefathers coming from South Africa and we because regard ourselves you are of Indian origin. Absolutely. So if you were walking down the street of London or in Fifth Avenue in New York, they're not going to tell you he's a South African Indian. Mm -hmm. They're going to say he's an Indian. Mm -hmm. So if you were an Indian and that's a tag you were given a coolie, be derogative as it may be, you was one. Mm -hmm. You was a slave. You was a slave. It is not acceptable in the modern sense of the word, but that was the reality. We cannot defeat and be blinded with what was the reality in those days of the people that suffered this indignity. You were treated as a slave because you was a slave. You were sent penniless. You were sent here to work you give given contracts, you give given a choice. The money that you earn today is not even worth mentioning because the denominations are no longer available. Absolutely. Uncle Avi, something else came to mind, right? We are born in South Africa. We should regard ourselves as South African. Going everywhere else in the world, we should say we are African. Are we still, as Indians, South African Indians, afraid to call ourselves African? <laughs> You know, I must make this bold statement. By now, you are fully aware that I'm a humanitarian. Absolutely. And I must say this quite, quite openly. To me, it's not what you are called. It's not what people perceive you to be. This debate, which is very unhealthy, of a, a white and a black, a European and an Indian, a Muslim and a colored and a black. We all believe in one God. That's the principle. It's a universal principle accepted by all language. So we are human beings. What people call you is just a figurative speech of the person identifying where you're coming from. And like I said earlier to you, you go anywhere in the world, you'll be called an Indian. So even generations after you, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will still be called Indians and not Africans. You're not an African. 
you are a human being born in South Africa. So even Africans have denominations. You are a Nigerian, you are an Ethiopian, you are Somalian, you are Kosa, you are Zulu. So how are we going to go on and on and bicep and uh, fragment ourselves? To me, you are a name and a number. You're born with a name and a number and you're going to die with a number. I do not respect people who get into debate which has been that I am an Indian of Indian origin, I'm an Indian born in South Africa, and where my loyalties lie. <laughs> your loyalties lie with your Creator, and He has asked you, all religions teach you that you respect the law of the land that you live in, and you do the laws, and you have to respect the laws, and accept what the government of the day has to offer you. Of course, tie your camel, and you got your Creator. Indeed. But I don't think get into this very, very unhygienic, unhealthy, unacceptable debate. For sure. Your centre, the 1860 Heritage Centre, a little bit more about it, and why did you get involved with the centre? Uh, it's a very, very important question, and I hope that the message goes uh, loud and clear. As we're sitting here 160 years after the arrival of Indians in this country, if no documented history is kept of any country, of any nation, of any events, any institution, any organization, then we're not leaving a legacy behind. And when I say legacy means that you have to be in a position like the previous question you asked, why is it Indian? And which Indians we are. And you may feel that it is contradicting to me now to be involved with the section of a thing. But, you know, there are museums, there are libraries all over the world that classify different languages, different religions, different customs. And in South Africa, there was not one to showcase the arrival in a proper institutionalized manner in, an, in a building. You know, unlike the books, you write a book, there are certain privileged people that have a book. Not everybody can afford a book, and not everybody will read a book. I won't read a book. I don't read books. So this is a place which was originally some 10 years ago was earmarked for the Indian uh, artifacts room. And it was then finally shut down. It was taken away back from the Indian community. And after you and Kri some seven years ago, being responsible with other directors, we were able to get this building and this artifacts back to make certain that we could fulfill the role of the contribution of Indians, fusion into the South African society. And there were other directors, which we are. It's a private company called 1860 Heritage Center. There are 11 directors. I'm the Muslim director on the board. And as a Muslim, I felt that I have a lot to offer from the Muslim perspectives because there was nobody suitable enough to take up the mantle to say, well, I will be part of it and being involved in petty politics of do we belong or do we not belong. So I got involved in being a financial director looking after the money. 1860 Heritage Center is a company formed and we get into a yearly agreement with the KwaZulu Natal government, which is on a yearly contract, and they call it the museum. So we fall under the Museum Act. Mm -hmm. So there are various acts that you have to follow. There are various bylaws, various governing laws that are made, and you sign a proper agreement. We <laughs> are liable for all the expenses which are paid for by the KwaZulu Natal government. So we have an accountability, a transparency with the KwaZulu Natal government. 
So it is an institution that needs to be supported by all, irrespective of race, color, or creed. It is not an Indian museum. It is a fusion of Indian museum into the South African society, a contribution made from 1860, the arrival of Indian, to the present time. And those that have not come, I invite you to please pay a visit. It is in Derby Street in Durban. It is only one of its kind in the country. Uh, there are things of interest there. It's a library. There are artifacts. There are various books. They are very educational. And it's something that you will be able to be proud of to say, at least there is a rich history that one has to look at the history, not look at who was the history of, but the history that has been documented and has been kept. And just like other communities, just like other countries in the world, uh, it is a very proud moment. I enjoy every minute of it. I am honored to be a member uh, of this very, very good institution. And with the KwaZulu Natal government, which wanted to be part of the celebrations, the celebrations which are going to be taking place on the 16th of November, this Monday, with the official <laughs> lighting of the lamp of the arrival of the 1860 on the beachfront, and then a formal ceremony at the center. Owing to COVID, we have restricted to 120 people. The Premier and the MEC of the <coughs> province will be present. And we regret that we could not get more people in there, but I hope that it's going to be televised, uh, maybe not live, but recorded. And of course, the media will be playing its due part. And of course, tabloid will be there to do a job that they we are will very, be very qualified to yeah, do. Absolutely. Uh, I think recording that entire event is going to be a very important milestone for tabloid as well. In no way you can divorce yourself from this historic moment. And tabloid has a history, and tabloid can play a meaningful role in letting not only the people of Natal and South Africa, but to let the world know that media plays a vital role in institutions like the 1860 Heritage Center and commemorating the 160 year arrival of the indentured laborers. Indeed it does, and it also coincides with Diwali, so it's going to be a double celebration there again. Uh, yes, yes, we must respect them and yes. we must wish our brothers and sisters that are celebrating this very, very spiritual uplifting, which is shown by the lamp, which gives light, and that light is focused to the world. So we must wish them well and pray that whatever their desires are and whatever they hope for, that God in his mercy uh, give and grant them what they really deserve. You know, I always say, God will only give you what you deserve. So whatever they deserve, and we pray all good for them. Well, thank you very much. Jazak Lankalevi, your time is very valuable. I know you're a busy man. You took out enough time to come and speak to me this morning, and it's really Thank you really very much. It is an honor and a privilege to be associated with the tabloid. And once again, I invite the viewers that 1860 Heritage Center is a must-see. If you haven't seen 1860 Heritage Center, you have not lived in Durban. Well, get your history. Go to the 1860 Heritage Center. Proudly South African, proudly Indian, proudly, proudly Kuli, proudly African. Always be a human being. You heard what my guest, Dr. A.V. Muhammad, said. Don't go away. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this break. Thank you. There you have it. Call them indentured laborers or slaves. There is no doubt that these forefathers had borne the harshness of colonialism. Yet they have prospered. Let not this history be lost and forgotten forever. One thing is clear, and that is a concise succession plan is indeed needed for the youth to continue this legacy. Get involved and continue to be the flag bearers of such a vibrant history stretching from India to South Africa. 
To all our Hindu viewers, we wish you a very happy COVID-free and spiritu spiritually fulfilling Diwali. Thank you for watching and keep those comments coming on our social media platforms. I'm Mohammed Ismail. See you soon.